morning, everyone. Um, I had a great night last night. I'm still picking glitter off my face. I think I'll be doing that for the next year, but anyway. I just want to say everyone looked amazing. What a great night we had here. And I'm so proud of everyone for making that effort to dress up and stuff, okay? Um, I just want to, yeah, thank you. I also just wanted to quickly mention um, there was enough gifts for everyone on the table and it seems like um, people picked up extra ones. So some people actually missed out. So if people wouldn't mind if you could drop um, some of the gifts back if you got double up because, it's, you know, we did have enough for everyone and I feel quite bad that some people didn't get gifts and people have certainly come up to me and Marnie and mentioned that. So, you know, it's an anonymous thing but if you don't mind dropping the extra one back to the desk so then someone else can get it. If still you don't get one, just let us know in the office and I'm happy to order some more from the artists but they were beautiful gifts. I've got a little tiny black baby on my desk at work and I hold that thing all the time and I'm like, this is my little baby because my baby's now 16 and she don't want me holding her so... <laughs> um, I just wanted to do a quick yarn today, and I, we really need to keep to time because we've got some workshops and stuff, but I kind of thought about what I could talk about, and, you know, I always feel a bit shame getting up here, but um, I've been flying around, as you all know, and I was in New Zealand, and I talked about my journey there with the crew, with the Maori nurses and stuff, and I can't... They were just so wonderful to me and some of the elders and stuff. So I thought I might just come and have a yarn because I know some people do know me and apologies if you've heard me tell this before, but I wanted to share my journey into nursing, into health and I guess to where I am now because what I want to do is get some of our young ones and some of our older ones to think about, hey, I could be Mel. I could be CEO of Catsnam, and I've got to say, I have the best job in the world. I love this job. So I just wanted to say that. Okay. And I'll try not to cry today. I was cheering it up at the ADM, so I'm going to keep it together today. So I just, oh, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, um, the Gadigal people, and, and of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their you know, elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge all the other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room and acknowledge your people as well, and there's lots of us, and my people too, and our elders. And for me, I always speak from the heart. I'm a straight shooter. Some people don't like it and I'm okay with that. You know, I do kind of want to get along with everyone, but I'm okay if you disagree with me and I'm happy to take that on board. And I also feel that my elders are always watching me. So I'm very conscious of what I do and what I say. Um, and, you know, I'm always happy to put, be pulled up. And I have been pulled up recently by some elders and I don't actually mind that. So please feel free to come and go, hey, Mel, what are you doing here? So my country, my birth country, um, I was born in a little town called Derby, which is north of Broome in the Kimberley of Western Australia. And there's an arrow there to my country. Um, my granny was part of the Stolen Generation, so she came from um, Lambu Station near Horse Creek to Beagle Bay Mission. We don't know how old she was when they took her because, you know, they didn't keep records back then. The St John of God nuns ran Beagle Bay Mission. We found some photos because they released all the records recently. Um, and there's a museum in Broome, so if you go there, make sure you have a look at it. Um, so we're still chasing her records. Um, it's been a difficult process for our family, and I'll lead into that. Um, she um, stayed in Beagle Bay. So we think she was about six or seven, but like I said, there's no records. She had um, three half-sisters there as well, and they were different ages, and one of them was a bit older than her, and they actually stayed really good friends right up till the, you know, till um, Granny died. Um, she... Um, then went to Broome to work as a domestic servant and in Broome, oops, um, she stayed there a couple of years I think and then Grandad came along. My granddad was a white man, cattleman, a pastoralist, a pioneer, whatever you want to say. Um, older guy, he was much older than her and they lined all the girls up and said, who wants to marry this white man, literally, and she stuck her hand up. So they got married. I think she was only like 21 or something, and he was something like 46. Um, and she um, then had nine children. 
Oh, and I'll just mention my mum's Anglo-Indian, so I'm kind of a multicultural in one. So we do have Indian connections as well. And I'm very proud of my Indian culture. Um, so Granny had nine children. Halfway through, she caught rheumatic fever and she was unwell, obviously. And then she had more children, which is not good when you've got rheumatic fever. And it led to mitral valve failure. And in, at the time, so sort of mid to early to mid um, 60s, if you were Aboriginal, they didn't give you any treatment. So by the time a doctor came along who could, you know, wanted to send her to Perth for the surgery, she was too sick to travel. So I met a, a nun who was a nurse and she told me this story that my granny was sitting up in the bed and she said, you know, she was like the queen. She was like royalty to people in the community and stuff. So, you know, such a proud woman and now not with us anymore. So she died at 52 in 1970, so two years before I was born but she's always with me. So that's all I'll say about her because I'll start crying. Um, and we have proud women in our family. So this is my mob. I put my younger photos in because I've you know, gained a bit of weight over the years. <laughs> I've still got skinny legs, mind you. Um, I actually, when I came to Catsnam, I was like, how gammon am I? I don't even have any photos of me in nurses' uniforms. So I was thinking I've got one in a box somewhere in storage in Perth on Noongar country, and I'm going to go dig it out when I get back. And it's a skinny me next to an ambulance with one of the drivers up in Derby when I was in my grad year. And I'm like, we had the beautiful white dress on, you know, and we used to climb in and out of the ambulance and stuff. I'll talk about my jobs anyway, but this is my mob. In the middle is all my cousins. So in our way, they're all my brothers and sisters. Um, up the end on your right, is the two girls in the green dresses. So my mum used to buy material and dress me and my sister the same, right? She used to make her clothes. They'd be different style, but same colour. Now, you would think, oh, that's good. She made your clothes, you look good, you're clean. My sister had serious identity issues from that and she still talks about it. Um, <laughs> so, um, look, our family, no one had been to university. I was the first. Um, I'm very proud of that and from that my aunties all went to uni and my sister went to uni and I'm very proud of my little sister, she's three years younger than me. She's got a PhD in fine arts, um, she works as a um, director in the Burnt Museum at the University of Western Australia. She's done so much there and I'm super proud of her and her and I are so competitive. So you can imagine our conversations. Um, I said to her when she got that PhD, where's my PhD, sis? Because um, it was a journey for her. She did hers in three years, which is like record time. She is mad focused. Um, she doesn't have any children. She's just committed to what she does. And I'd love her to come and speak to all of you because she is so passionate about what she does. And she's been doing some lectures with the doctors. So using art and cultural artefacts um, to teach empathy with clinicians. It's a big movement in America and it's really powerful. So I'd love her to come and talk about that with us. Um, yeah, because she tells an amazing story and it's amazing how art does teach you a lot, and our art and our artefacts definitely do. So she brings people in. Um, she's got a bit of a campaign going on, so I better do a plug for it. She's trying to raise money to build a museum. So the Burnts were anthropologists, and I know they anthropologists have a bit of a rap, but um, they actually were welcomed into communities, and there's paintings of them in the painting by artists and stuff, because they really fitted in, and they documented stuff that is a phenomenal record. And they've got a massive collection there, but they're in this tiny little basement and they've got nowhere to show it. So she's trying to get some money to kind of build a proper building and really show that stuff. But if you ever go to UWA, and she'll be shouting at me for saying this, um, she takes people through and shows them and she's taken some ministers through and stuff, but they've got some phenomenal stuff in there. They've also got some men's business stuff and they're all women, so they had to get their elders in to kind of go through some of that stuff. And she tells me stories about, you know, she feels spirits and stuff, so when she's touching things or near things that women shouldn't be, then those spirits come through as well. 
And we had a sort of an experience in the office recently. Um, we were cleaning out the storeroom. <laughs> Sounds weird. And we pulled everything out. And I was going, there's some sort of energy here. And we found a wrapped up didgeridoo. I think it was bought as a gift for someone. And we're all women in our office. And I was like, going, that's got to get out of here. Um, one of the, you know, we can't unwrap it. It's a man's thing. So we gave it to um, Floss's son because he plays the didge. And he's going to come and do some music for us. But I'm like, we can't have man stuff in a women's space. And the energy feels really different in there. And the team and I were talking about that. So, see, I'm going off on a track already. Make sure you keep me on time. Um, down on the right as well are my two aunties, <laughs> looking glamorous. Um, so, um, one of my aunties there is Aunty Sib. She was a nurse, a paediatric nurse. And when I was seven, I remember saying to Aunty Sib, I want to be a nurse like you. And that was when I knew what I wanted to do with my life. And I'm so proud of her. She's retired now, but she still bosses everyone in the family about their health and they ring her up for advice. And she's still got her medical dictionary there next to her table. She pulls it out all the time. She cuts us articles out of the paper, you know. Um, if there's something going on in the family, if there's an article on that, she'll cut it out, she'll post it to you. She's deadly, I swear to God. Um, the other thing to quickly mention, because... Um, my dad, his brothers and his sisters were going to be removed um, by the police. The police actually came to the station. But because Grandad was a white man, he actually bribed them and they had to go to boarding school. So my dad went to boarding school as a real young boy and he said it was very traumatic in Geraldton. And um, that was, you know, their way around getting removed. And we have massive identity issues in our family. So some days we're black and some days we're not, according to the aunts and uncles and my dad. And I think it really leaves a scar on that generation. Um, all of them are now 70 to 78. My uncle just turned 78 the other day, but they still carry trauma from that process. So just to mention that. Um, and some of the... Just a disclaimer, some of the boys in the boys' photo um, have passed away as well. We've lost a lot of mob. And there up the top are some of the waterways we swam in as kids. We swam everywhere, billabongs and stuff. Nowadays they warn you about getting disease from the water, but back then we just jumped in the water. And one of them is the Rapidy one, is my favourite place in the wet season. So I used to get a tyre tube and like float down there. I don't know how none of us drowned or anything, but you know, black kids, they can swim. So... <laughs> So I graduated from Curtin University. I did a Bachelor of Science nursing degree. It took me three and a half years. Only black kid in the class. Um, I met one of the other nurses that graduated with me the other day. And I'm going to get my uni photo, so you'll be seeing all this around somewhere. So um, skinny back then. <laughs> Pretty good looking, not, not so now skinny. Um, this is my journey here and I just wanted to stick up some photos and talk about, I guess, where my love of rural health comes from. So I went to boarding school in Geraldton, all girls, nuns, horrible experience, but I loved learning and I had these great male teachers who loved me. So my sister, when she came along, they were like, why aren't you more like Mal? She's great, you know. So there goes that competition again. Um, <laughs> I started my career in Derby Hospital as a graduate nurse in 1994. Um, a bit like now, back then, um, there was heaps of graduate nurses and there was no way in hell I was going to get a program. I actually paid some of my money to write my application and I still didn't even get an interview. There was, you know, we've come a long way in terms of getting our mob into graduate programs and I'll talk a bit about that for Western Australia context anyway. But, you know, we're still struggling, but it's way better when I was a, than when I was a grad. So I went back to Derby Hospital there was another Aboriginal nurse there who since passed away and it broke my heart because she left within a couple of months of me starting because of racism from those nurses that were working there. I begged her to stay with me and she just couldn't do it anymore um, because it was really bad. Now it's more hidden. Back then, they had no shame. They'd just say it and hand over and everything. And her and I used to be like... This is our community. These are our people you're making these comments about, you know. Please don't do it. 
Um, we had a lot of um, junior nurses come up and do rotations back then as well, and they were great because they just wanted to learn. So I remember the Fitzroy River was flooding and I took them out and we were drinking emu export, sorry, shouldn't be encouraging drinking, and we were cherubining and I was telling them stories and stuff because they were really keen to learn, but there was this cohort of older nurses who just didn't care and they didn't care what they said and I felt really sad for that lady um, because she had worked really hard to get through her degree and become, you know, a nurse. And, and it was, for me, I guess, in some ways, a bit of Granny's journey and her journey um, just fires me up, I tell you. And I always think about her. Her daughter is now an elder. Her daughter is my sister's age. My sister's 44, you know. How can you be an elder in a community, you know, at that age and take on that responsibility? And she does it, and she's amazing. Her name's Leah Umrugai. If you go to Derby in Mindjum community, they have an art centre. She does all that stuff. She's a great artist. But she's lost her mum, and her mum was like us, you know. So we've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go. So while I was up in Derby, I went up to Fitzroy Crossing Hospital, which I loved. I love Fitzroy. It's a great little hospital. Um, you know, as a grad in the country, and I couldn't promote it more, you do bloods, you do x-rays, you do everything. You'd be out in the ambulance. I used to do halfways between Derby and Fitzroy. You were everything for everyone. And it was a great learning opportunity for me. But the reason I left was, again, um, an Aboriginal lady. Um, she had really bad liver problems. And I remember I was, you know, trying to pull her through and she just couldn't do it. So she passed away and in some ways that broke my heart, so I had to go away then. So then I travelled overseas, but then I came back from England. I went to England for six months, worst six months of my life. It was winter time, it was dark. But I did do some work over there, but yeah, I found it really difficult over there. But lots of people go and work overseas and it's a really good opportunity. And then when I came back, I worked at a place called Royal Perth Hospital. So back then, Royal Perth was a tertiary hospital for the state. So every patient from around Western Australia came there. I started in aged care. I loved aged care. I love old people, like I just really do. But um, then I moved into a medical ward. So um, I learned all these sort of medical skills that you really need to be a good clinician. Like yarning to people, sitting with them, looking at them knowing what someone looks like when they're well, knowing what someone looks like when they're unwell. On that medical ward, I used to coordinate. We had like we used to have two or three resources going at the same time. So it had everything, dermatology, respiratory, acute medical conditions, and people would just like arrest all the time. I remember I had someone in conscious VF and then someone had in cardiac arrest and we had one trolley and we're like, eh. And you know, coordinating that is such an experience but I still missed my country days and I do share it with people. You know, I wanna be like Jason, where is he? A remote area nurse one day, that is my dream. But yeah, being in an acute hospital was good for me. And again, there was so many stories I could tell you and I haven't got much time, but this old fella come in from the desert and he was really unwell. He didn't speak a lick of English and you know, they were being so culturally disrespectful to him and I had to educate them, you know. So you not only have your own patient load, you're not only coordinating a shift, but you also got to be an advocate for all your people that are in that unit or, you know, walking out in the wards or, you know, when people pass away, you see them grieving, so you've got to go up. So you've got all this extra responsibility. And I just remember, like, saying to them, you white ladies shouldn't be sharing this old man. Like, he's a really well-respected old man. So it's that educating and that advocacy. And as you all know, it's pretty gruelling. So then I went overseas again. You know, got to love going overseas. I was saying to people, shame. I haven't even been around my own country, but I've been overseas. Um, so then I came back from Dublin. I lived in Dublin for a year and I worked as a nurse there and my registration didn't come through. If you go to the UK... You go through the UKCC, which is the nurses board over there. They take forever to process the application. It might be a bit quicker now. And I finally got my registration when I came back to Australia. Sorry, <laughs> gammon. I had to... Um, <laughs> that's my new word, gammon. Sorry, everyone. I had to come back. Um, I had to work there as an assistant in nursing. 
I don't care, I just work however. They love me there, those patients and stuff. What an experience, you know, learning about another culture. I love Irish people anyway, so that's another story. Um, <laughs> then when I came back, I thought, yeah, maybe I'll have a go at paediatrics. So I fell into it. You know, I did want to be a paediatric nurse, like I said, with only Sib, but I didn't ever think I was ready. So I applied for a job in oncology, haematology and paediatrics. Um, Everyone going in here, what? You go from adults to that? I went to the interview and I was like, there's no way they're going to give me this job. I've never worked in paediatrics. Oncology and haematology are very specialised. There's no way they're going to employ me. But they employed me, so that was good. Um, great place to work, but, we, you know, children die in oncology. We lose about, in WA anyway, about 30 kids a year. Um, very, very difficult space to work in, but I absolutely love it. And I loved it, you know, back then. And some of the nurses are still there, mad, because I wouldn't stay there. But anyway, um, we didn't see a lot of Aboriginal patients in that unit, which was really interesting. But now we're starting to see our kids are getting cancer, um, which is really interesting. But back then, we hardly ever saw an Indigenous kid. But I nursed a lot of kids and a lot of families. So as a professional, I obviously love our mob but I also look after anyone. So I'm so focused when I'm on a ward, like don't talk to me, I've got things to do. Um, you know, I'm always running around, stocking, you know, I always find stuff to do. I love my nursing. Um, I worked there for nine years. I did a year in ICU in paediatrics at their big hospital and I absolutely hated it because the racism was unbelievable in there. And I'll just give you a quick example. Um, we had a little baby come in, oh, I think it was about six weeks old, little little Aboriginal baby, and um, they couldn't quite work out what was wrong with it, and they'd done an X-ray, and it had a, like an old fracture on its leg, and, you know, this, you know, is not a good thing. And we were doing lumbar punctures, and this blood kept coming out in spinal fluid, and, you know, my oncology had on, it's really unusual to get blood in spinal fluid, so we knew something had happened to that baby and it, it was the shaken baby. And I remember going into there to look after the little bubba, and um, I remember the two grandparents were in there, and they almost like grabbed me, and you've probably all had this experience, they grabbed me and they were like, oh, thank God you're here, you know, like we really need you. And I said, what's been going on? And they said, oh, these, mob, these nurses, they treating us like we did this to this baby, you know? And I said, yeah, they shouldn't be being like that. Like, it's not your fault. This is not my job to judge. That's child protection's job. You know, I'm here to look after the bubba and to look after you guys. But the judgment and the, I guess, the unconscious, or the conscious bias and the racism that comes from our clinicians is unbelievable. And this story is still happening today. Um, so I just said to them, not on. Um, they hadn't even been offered the Aboriginal Liaison ALO service. They hadn't had any sort of medical information. So I got a meeting with the consultants and all the family together. And I just reassured them, like, I'm here for you. And, you know, it's not my job to judge who did what. I'm here to look after you. So in my own way, I made a difference. And I thought, oh, I'm not just going to let this go. I'm going to the nurse unit manager there. She was probably about my age. And she says to me, well, you know how they do it. Um, it's not about their race. We, this is what how all people with a baby in this situation feel. And I said to her, this is about race. This is not about all people. This is about how they feel. And she would not acknowledge that. And that just really drives me to get wild. Um, but I, you know, I said to her, you, this whole unit has a lack of cultural safety you know, and things need to change here and for the better. But, you know, in some way, like midwives and nurses, we make, us Indigenous mob make a difference in our own special way. So I don't think, sometimes it's hard and you can't change everyone and it's unfair and that's just what I'll leave you with and we all know that. But that's, I guess, what drives me in some ways as well. Then I... Um, Left Princess Margaret and went to Marmodich training. Where's my Marmodich mob in here? 
Are they here? Ah, oh, there they are. Hello, Leanne. Um, and I worked in Marmodich from 2008 to 2013, and I loved Marmodich. Marmodich is an um, Aboriginal registered training organisation. Um, I looked after the enrolled nurses there and the Aboriginal health workers and did training, and I loved it. Um, sometimes when you get burnt out of mainstream services and you're tired and you're worn and I'd had a, um, my marriage had fallen apart, I was a single parent of a four-year-old, I was losing my mind, I was grieving and all that stuff, um, you need to go back into our spaces and you need to recharge and that's what Marmodich was for me. So I sat in the meetings going, I love you, so I love this place, you know, <laughs> like it was really good for me. Um, Oh, see, I only got five minutes. I've been talking too much already. I can't do my other thing. But anyway, um, Marmodich was fantastic for me and I loved it there and I learnt about vocational education training. I learnt about the challenges. So some of my... Um, I call them my ends like they're mine, but they are my ends, aren't they, Leanne? Um, I loved Marmodich, but again... They'd go into hospitals and patients would grab them, hang on to them, tell them stuff. There was one patient, they couldn't even understand what he's saying. Our ENs walked in there. Within two minutes, they worked out what he was saying and it was all sorted. Do you know what I mean? They'd been trying to work out for weeks. So Marmodish was great. Um, I didn't want to leave, but, you know, sometimes you've got to go on another journey. So... And I still advocate for Marmodish and I still talk to them and everything. So then I went into the WA Department of Health. Well... Gammon. <laughs> um, and sorry to my health department people. Probably get back to Wendy, but anyway. Um, I loved it there, but I'm like, policy drives me wild, okay? So, but I did a lot of good stuff there. I ran a cadet program. Um, it was in, it's in Noongar country, in Wadjuk country. So, hello to all the Noongars out there. Um, in my solid. Um, and I worked there for, you know, nearly four years, and then I got this job. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, while I was there, <laughs> I love policy. Policy is great, but it's a tough space. And, um, you know, some of my cadets that are now grad nurses and midwives in here, they know the challenges I went through because they'd hear me, you know, shouting around. Um, but, yeah, so we wrote an Aboriginal workforce strategy. They still use it. Um, great consultation process. And I guess what I want to say by this is being a nurse... Being Indigenous and doing policy, this is the best document in Western Australia. It's statewide and from this um, we created a workforce policy with priorities around medical grads, nursing and midwifery grads, um, graduate programs, pathways, traineeships, cadetships, which is still in existence. And then we developed a statewide Aboriginal health and wellbeing framework which I wasn't involved in, but, you know, my stuff informed it, and an implementation guide. And they've now all the health services over there are accountable. The chief executives report to the CE every quarter against measures in this, and they're held to account by the DG for that. So, you know, this is the stuff we can do because we understand the issue. So very proud of it. And I just wanted to quickly go through my priorities because i only got two minutes now. Um, Catsnam, you know, I tell people, it's you guys at the AGM heard it, I was crying up. Um, but Catsnam changed my life. Um, Ma Moody's told me about Catsnam. I'd already been working for like, you know, 15 years by then. I needed to know about Catsnam when I was in uni. So for me, Catsnam is a massive, massive place for all of us to go, yarn up, get strength you know, recharge our batteries before we go back to where we work because we will work in tough spaces. So I think my vision and the board's vision and Marnie's vision all line up. Um, you know, I will advocate for you guys and I'm already doing it in the, you know, meetings with ministers and stuff like that. So I'm with you. It's all around our four priorities that are in our strategic plan Marnie and me got a plan, wink, wink. Um, and, you know, we're here for you, but I'm taking it back to you, the members, and I'm saying, what do you want? What do you need? What are the issues for you? And then I'm going back and advocating. So I guess by telling you that story, and I'm going to wind up now, because I will get the wind up, um, I think that my journey led me to this point, 
And I think we're in a good space now to really drive change across this country. I don't want our mob dying in prison, you know, from head injuries and stuff. I don't want our mob dying in hospitals or not outside a hospital because the hospital wouldn't treat them. It's unacceptable and we need to change the system and I'm going to do that in my own way. Um, I feel like I made a change in WA Health and people come up to me all the time over there and go, we really miss you because you really made a difference. This is not about me, this is about our people. So that's what I wanted to say is that I'm here for all of you, every single one of you, and I will take your call and I will listen to your story and I will share that. And money's the same, you know, we want to work together to really drive change in our country because at the moment... We, we've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go, so... Um, there's my details. I am available if anyone needs me. I'm so proud of you all for coming out to the conference, and I'll have a yarn up this afternoon, cos, yeah, we got to go. But um, I wanted to also talk today about the Closing the Gap stuff, but I haven't left enough time. Typical. Um, I just wanted to say, we sent out a survey recently, um, and hopefully everyone got it, but I'll get the girls to blast it out again because we really need to fill in the Nacho survey around closing the gap. I'm really proud of the Coalition of Peaks. It's been a tough road, Denella's ride, but I want you all to tell everyone to fill in that survey because that will build strength for us to know. We, we think we're on the right track, but we want to know what you think um, because we want to take that back to the politicians and to the COAG and everyone to really drive change with closing the gap. And I did want to do the presentation, Janella, sorry, but I talked too much, so. <laughs> um, but I'll send out some information and I think, yeah, fill in the survey if you can. So thanks, everyone. <laughs> Okay, so we've got um, morning tea now. Um, there's three um, plenaries after, so just have a look at the app if you've got it. Um, we're splitting this room, so if everyone wouldn't mind just moving out so they can divide the room up and we'll have some morning tea. And then back into the next session at 11, whichever one you want to go to. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank